Okay, thank you very much for attending this session. Um, I'm Steen, and I would like to share some insights from a project that we did in Flanders, the northern region of Belgium, uh, about deriving policy-relevant geodata from satellite images. And I think it uh, complements well with the final question of the last session, which was about law enforcement, and that's what exactly what we've been trying to uh, do in some of our use cases. So I guess you're all familiar with uh, the need for environmental policy, but I want to stress some of the things that are really important uh, also in our local environment in Flanders. So uh, you can see, yeah, we've been um, referred to court because we don't take enough action on the nit nitrate pollution. I guess that's a problem in several countries as well. Uh, we also have a lot of issues with uh, blue algae that are contaminating our swimming waters in summer. With my children, they want to go to surfing camp and they cannot go because of blue algae. Um, we also want, we need more um, data and more action for our forests because we have very little forests left and we want to know what's happening to them um, in a better way. So, and there's a lot already available for policymakers in Europe. What's very nice, I think, is the high resolution layers from Copernicus. We're using them indirectly also uh, for policy support. The water monitor, where we already are in the process of monitoring the water quality in Flanders, and also there are things happening in, at the European level as well. And something else like the flood awareness system, uh, because we've had quite some floods over the recent years, just a few weeks ago here, and also um, in 2021, a really big one in the south of Belgium. And so why did we decide to have a project about this? Because as we've seen also in a lot of presentations here, we thought a few years ago when we were writing this project proposal, the time was right. We had the Copernicus um, data already for a few years, so we had time series. We could train models with data from different years. And also we had like these new powerful deep learning algorithms that we thought we should test out also in this context. So that's why we did the GeoInform project, where we took satellite imagery, specifically from Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, because we really wanted to focus on freely available uh, data. Uh, and we fed them to deep learning models to actually get geodata for policy support at the local level. So we had some scientific partners. I was working at KU Leuven, University of Leuven, but I'm also associated with the Institute for Nature and Forest Research of the Flemish government. FITO was also one of the project partners. And then we had uh, F Information Flanders, which is the agency uh, that's in charge of the geodata in Flanders. And then we worked really closely together, which is, think, I think, something very important also mentioned here before, with policymakers at the local level. So we had some stakeholders uh, from the Agency of Nature and Forest, Flemish Land Agency, Flemish Environmental Agency, and also the Department of Environment directly like uh, doing, giving data actually to our, our ministry as well. So very important because we were in a co-design um, project. We asked the stakeholders what we should monitor. And so we did this because we started the project in COVID. We did this through an online questionnaire um, and we got, a lot, we got a lot of responses. So they had 23 proposals of things that they thought extra geodata would be really nice to have for policy support. But of course, not all of these uh, proposals were feasible. So we as scientific partners did a feasibility assessment focusing on three aspects. The first thing was the scale. Is it feasible with the freely available satellite images? Um, is the detail there big enough? The second thing was, um, is it directly visible from a satellite image? We didn't want to go into these uh, derived things like um, recreational pressure and stuff like that. We wanted to see things that were like biophysically visible from satellite images. So we ended up with a short list of 15 use cases. And then we sat together with the stakeholders to decide like which of these 15 are for you most policy relevant in Flanders. And then we came up with a final selection of eight cases of which we, in the end, we managed to do seven because one of them didn't really yeah, go so well. I think most of them are quite 
of, or some of them are quite straightforward, but I want to go a little bit deeper into the biological valuation map because that's very important in Flanders for the biodiversity monitoring. It's a map of all the habitats, the Natura 2000 habitats in Flanders, and we really wanted to see if uh, with satellite imagery we could make this map updated because now it's based on fieldwork and obviously uh, the fieldwork is being cut down everywhere, so we could not update it for the entire region. Something else I want to uh, focus on here right now is the catch crops, because that's exactly what was mentioned in the previous section, what the stakeholder wanted there. They are in charge of actually seeing whether, um, whether farmers comply with the need for uh, putting cover crops on their fields in the winter. And they wanted to see early in the season, can we see which farmers are not doing what we should do? Can we go there and then they don't get uh, the finances that are associated with this. So um, also we've seen this quite a few times here. We used open EO, um, not so much for the training of the actual models, but for getting the time series, the, the, the input data. And also uh, we used it to put, to, if we had a trained model, we used it to um, apply this model to the entire Flemish area through this uh, user-defined functions. I don't know if you're familiar with OpenEO, but it's quite nice to see how it scales. So in a technical way, we had uh, two main challenges. The first challenge is that most of the deep learning, traditional deep learning methods are actually created for very high resolution data in an RGB context. And the second challenge is that we environmental monitoring in general, and specifically for the use cases that our stakeholders wanted us to focus on, we really had a limited uh, amount of labeled data available. So we tested some potential solutions to these. Um, for the non-standard inputs, we tried different band combinations, but we also designed models that could accommodate more than three bands, so four plus bands. Um, we also focused a lot on time series as input because the phonology was very important for a lot of our applications and also focusing on some of the uh, newer um, models that could actually take this uh, temporal component into account. And then we also did some data fusion. Well, we tried to combine optical data and uh, radar data from Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1. And then for the uh, limited labeled instances, so lack of training data actually, we first assessed the uh, potential of model transferability in different contexts. And then we went a step further uh, to actually see if models trained for another application could be used for some of our applications. We're also in the process of implementing data augmentation. It's a PhD student at the University of Leuven that's currently working on this, trying to it's quite established for, uh, for images, but for time series to see like whether we could make synthetic time series that are still, that still makes sense from a biophysical uh, point of view. Then we also had uh, some, we did some experiments with semi-supervised learning, where you also use like unsupervised data uh, to train parts of the model that can then be used with uh, a limited amount of label data afterwards. And then we also did some model-based refinements of labels where we actually took the output of the model or the probabilities outputted by the model to see on which locations we could best go on the field and um, gather more data. So these are some of the, the outputs. It's, I'm not gonna go through all of them because that would take me too long. So what you can see here is that um, in the experiments that we did for the biological valu valuation map, we saw that the models for more than uh, three channels, so other than RGB, did not really improve the results very much. So we, stick, we stuck with the uh, RGB models there. Um, when we combined, this is for the water, uh, the, a case of water detection, when we combined Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. So if we wanted, if we only tested on a cloud-free test set, we could see that Sentinel-2 was doing very well, maybe even better than the combination, but as soon as things were getting clouded, which unfortunately when you are in a flooded situation is often the case, then we could see that like the combination of the two was outperforming both Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 by itself. Here are some results on uh, 
transferability, model transferability. That's some of the results from a PhD student at KU Leuven. So what she did was she made models um, for trained on a single year and then uh, validated on the same year. And then she tried to see if, um, if you train it for another year, will it still work as good? Obviously it didn't. But then we started to add data from different years. So let's say we have, we want to do predictions in 2022. I think that's the one that makes the most sense. It's the one, oh, sorry. The one right there. So if we want to do predictions for 2022, um, what happens if we add training data for multiple years? You know, not just training on one year, but adding 2018 to 2022. And then we saw that yeah, the accuracy went up and it, in some cases it even reached the level uh, of the, the same year models, which was quite nice. And then for, uh, for the transfer models, I think this has been mentioned also in one of the uh, workshops before. We actually used a temp CNN. It, it's um, one of the newer temporal uh, convolutional neural network models. And they have this open GitHub where they, they actually trained multiple temporal models. So models that take a time series, deep learning models, and that then output um, crop, a crop uh, classification. But they trained their models only on uh, main crops. And we wanted to do winter crops. Um, so the seasons don't really align very well. So we first thought, okay, we just take the same model. We put the whole year, but yeah, most of the models couldn't handle that very well. And then uh, we did an experiment where we shifted our inputs so that the phenology of the winter crops would align better with uh, the phenology of the main crops that this model was pre-trained for. We just did this one experiment for now. We want to go deeper into like, yeah, how can we better, uh, even better align this? And you can see the accuracies are not, I mean, TempCNN is, is one of the best models. I think it was also mentioned in one of the workshops. Um, but it's not wor working that great for all of our classes yet. So we need to do more experiments to see if we could shift it in a different way. And I think one of the things also is that in their pre-trained model, they use clouded data uh, as well. And we always worked with cloud um, masking. So it's something yeah, that we should also, maybe we can train a model on uh, the main crops in Flanders and then use it on the, on the winter crops when shifted. That's something we should also look into. So the main things we found, I didn't show all the results, but I will go into our main findings. So in general, contradictory to what we thought for our uh, biological evaluation map, the near infrared band did not really outperform the RGB images. So including it didn't really help. The spatial resolution was still a problem for us. So I think in a lot of the cases, uh, also the, the end users said like, we actually really need this resolution. So maybe we can also do combination of orthophotos and uh, the time series of satellite imagery. What we found in general is that the accuracy increases through the use of time series instead of single images. And also something very recent uh, by a colleague of another, um, another research group at KU Leuven, he's still working on this is that he is using SWIN transformers now, and he sees that it, they're really outperforming the CNNs uh, by a large degree. And also that combining optical and radar data, especially if you have clouded input images, can be an advantage. And then the model transferability can also be improved through combining the training data from multiple years. I was uh, explaining that through transfer learning, provided that you have a good model to start from, for time series, that's still a problem. There's not so much available. And also uh, by using uh, model outputs or model uh, uncertainties to increase your training power by going on the field in the, um, at these locations that can help your model the most. And also for the supervised learning, we saw that it didn't really increase the accuracy that much, but it really reduced the computer power needed for training. So then we developed also an output for the end users. Uh, we have these web viewers that they can use where they can see, yeah, it's all in Dutch because our end users are Dutch, but I hope you can at least get an, an idea about it. They can see a classification. They can go into detail about that, but they can also see for each of the classes separately, like the probabilities, and there's a threshold slider there. 
So they can go up and down and then they can see like which areas are more or less uh, certain. And then uh, one other nice thing that we have is um, we can, we, they can actually delineate things that they think are wrong or where they have extra data. They can put that also into our, um, into our web viewer and then we can collect those data and use them for the next iteration of the models. Um, maybe some thoughts also on working with policymakers. I presented this slide at the beginning of the project, so that's what I thought we were going to need to do. So, yeah, well, obviously just uh, regular feedback. We did that. We showed intermediate results and models, even if they were not perfect. Maybe we didn't do that enough, because as scientists, we really want to show something when it's working. Um, and also, like, manage expectations, like, make them understand that we cannot really fully replace their field measurements like that. But I think in the end, we had a really nice cooperation with the end users, but we can still see that it's a challenge, and it's specifically um, getting the message across that how to interpret like uncertainties. That's really something that we focused on, and we hope with the sliders and the web viewers we can make some progress in that. Uh, and also, I think what we, what, we, what we really learned is that it's very hard for them to understand the technicalities and also what's possible and what's not possible. So it, it's, yeah, we really, it needed a lot of iterations and we had this end workshop uh, two weeks ago and there were some people that were really like, okay, yeah, I think I understand now. But then you go back in a few weeks and they're like, oh wait, how does it work? So it, yeah, it's a constant like interaction to, to keep them engaged, I think. That was my presentation. Thank you very much.